very good afternoon to everyone. And at the outset, I obviously start by thanking Dr. Uni and Dr. Manoj for making me a part of this academic feast. And thanks to my previous speakers with some excellent talks on wet AMD. I shift the focus to uh, non-neovascular AMD and start with this talk on when the infrared autofluorescence goes over short wave or the blue wave autofluorescence. So depending upon the uh, emission filter, the uh, stimulating lights, the kind of camera, and your other settings, you could have various autofluorescence which have been uh, described. And uh, the focus today is going to be on the infrared autofluorescence and how does it compare with the uh, short wave. So this is what I have marked here. This is what we have the short wave and this is how the infrared looks like. And I will want to cover some bit of this NIR, the uh, near infrared reflectance as well, because it closely follows the uh, infrared autofluorescence and sometimes is much more easily freely available as compared to the NIA. So it, um, autofluorescence is a very useful technique, especially when we are going to study the non-neovascular AMD, and it depends upon basically two major pigments in the RPE, the lipofusin and melanin. And uh, the technique of uh, um, getting this uh, autofluorescence is different when we look at NIR autofluorescence vis-a-vis -vis the short wave autofluorescence. So this is the stimulation light is in the infrared range. This is in the blue light range. And we have an emission filter at 800 nanometer, 500 here. And all this is done so that the emitted light from the melanin in the choroid and RP is recorded with the infrared autofluorescence and largely from lipofusin when we look at blue autofluorescence. So these are two different pigments which are present in the retina in addition to other pigments also, but this is the major ones. And uh, melanin is present in the RPE and choroid, and uh, it is the main fluorophore which is described here in the infrared autofluorescence. And lipofusin is the ma major uh, fluorophore which is assessed. This is how a normal short wave autofluorescence looks like. Most important feature here is that the macula or the fovea here is hyperreflective, and the near infrared, the fovea or the macula is hyperreflective, and this is what we make use of when we apply it to various clinical pathologies. Disadvantage, just to begin with, why we are talking of NIF, if the short wave is so perfect, where is the need for the other kind of autofluorescence? As I said, foveal evaluation, the characteristic features are different and physically probably a little uncomfortable because you have a bright light, which is, um, you know, especially for children, they are uncooperative because the bright light is focused onto the retina for a long period of time. So with this little background, let us see what clinical scenarios we can use it in. And first one is uh, age-related macular degeneration, especially a fovea uh, geographic atrophy, which is inside the fovea. In, in a blue autofluorescence, it may be difficult to pick up because the atrophy will also be hyperreflective. The fovea itself in normal eye is hyperreflective. So this is very easy to miss. Vis-a-vis -vis the infrared autofluorescence, the fovea here is hyperreflective, so if the atrophy is hyperreflective, it gets a good contrast and shows up very well. So this is how the uh, infrared it scores over the blue autofluorescence, where the picking up of geographic atrophy is concerned in AMD. Also, the early detection, even outside the fovea, areas of hyperreflectivity uh, on the infrared autofluorescence are more easily picked up as compared to the blue autofluorescence. So this helps in early detection as well. So this is just an example here. Uh, I have uh, one of my patients. This is infrared reflectance and not autofluorescence because as I said, this was, this is more easily available for with me. I did not have access to the autofluorescence, but you can see the atrophy is so very nicely picked up on a reflectance as well. But here on an autofluorescence, the blue autofluorescence, you can actually miss the atrophy. And it not only does, does it pick up the atrophy, but it also picks up the hyperfluorescent uh, lesion here corresponding to the um, hemorrhage, which is there. And obviously, the OCT picked up that this was a case of early RAP. In pigment, wherever you have pigment-free uh, dispersion in cases of dry AMD, 
Again, infrared will be able to pick it up, but autofluorescence in the blue spectrum may miss it. So the pigmentary alterations are also easily picked up on an infrared range. You can see the, the short wave is not able to pick up any uh, information on fovea, but if you see the reflectance here, it shows you some irregularities which are present. So based on this, there has been classification in AMD, and uh, the most important clinical take-home sign was when they, this paper, they discussed the difference. They found that almost 27% or 24% of the eyes, they, they missed geographic atrophy if they only used the short wave autofluorescence. So the clinical recommendation is that along with the short wave, at least NIR, which is freely available, should be used in most of the OCT scans that we do, they have a, a associated an NIR or the reflectance which is available, and this helps us uh, look into uh, our geographic atrophy very well. Just to go through, since the time is short, I'll just quickly go through the other areas where it can be useful in HCQ toxicity. You can pick it up very early, and you can show it a much larger area can be seen. In IRDs, you have this, this is the comparison. You can see areas of atrophy are much larger on NIA as compared to short wave. And also, if you have foveal atrophy, it is very easily picked up on NIA. Similar for ABCA4, other lesions, you can see much larger areas of atrophy are seen. We know that on short wave, you could have hypo or hyper autofluorescence, but usually most of the areas which have hyper autofluorescence on FAF end up having hypo on NIR as well. So the areas of hypoautofluorescence are much more in NIR. So this is how it is. Uh, again, in cases of acute macular neuropathy, you can see the reflectance is probably the only thing which gives you an early uh, sign of AMN, even when your short wave autofluorescence or fundus photograph is normal. Even the NIA or the infrared autofluorescence shows it up very well. In Azure, this is a good uh, publication from uh, Rupak and Dr. Dehavat, who is right here. And you can see that the area of uh, hypoautofluorescence is much more, or the zone three is much more re depicting the advanced cell loss in the RT when you image with the NIA. So limitations, because uh, we, none of the two are perfect. Each one has its own uh, advantages and disadvantages. And if you change the opacity or you change, you have media opacities, again, the interpretation will be different. So maybe quantitative autofluorescence, which we will hear about subsequently, may give us the answers. And multimodal imaging definitely will be more useful than relying on a single parameter. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think in summary, um, I would, uh, what I learned was that near infrared is probably scoring better over blue peak autofluorescence in AMD, especially if it comes to the foveal lesions. Yes, that is right. the primary indication, which is why I just started with that. Now, I, I, in fact, uh, I find uh, near infrared also very useful for choroditis lesions. I find that in patients with choroditis, it gives you a very nice uh, demarcation of the lesion. In fact, even your near infrared reflectance image yes. can give you very nice demarcation. And the blue peak, however, is very useful in more superficial uh, lesions. So do you also feel that the uh, depth of the lesion has yeah. a difference in appearance in the two? The depth of the appearance, the RPE and choroid, if the lesions are deeper, they are definitely picked up much better on an infrared reflectance. In fact, I think infrared reflectance is underutilized. It gives us a lot more information. It is easily available, and you even have access to wide field or ultra-wide field infrared reflectance with the newer imaging techniques. So you can actually see um, probably the choroid vessels, the dilated vessels in, on an NIR and reflectance image reflectance. without doing an ICG also. But then that remains to be explored. We are not using it enough mm -hmm. is what I think. I, I think one thing, another driving point home is that you could have contrasting appearance on blue peak and near infrared. For example, in nudes patients, you could have totally contrasting hyper and hypo appearance. So I think it's good to use them complementary together. Any comments from the panel? No, on the, uh, you know, on your views of uh, infrared, in, infrared imaging, um, is it possible for you to see PCV? Because they are primarily uh, the PEDs that you pick up. I had uh, done some work on that, but I, I felt you could pick up, but I'm, I'm, I just was curious whether you have tried using so it. So the reflectance here acts on the basis of almost like a retro image. 
Correct. So anything which is in front of it gets very well delineated. So the PD and the polyps are going to get very well delineated if especially uh, they have a third dimension or they are raised. So the reflectance is very good for those things and definitely should be seen. I had an example, didn't show it up, but I had a child, four year old, who had um, optic disc maculopathy. So he was not cooperative for photography or anything other procedure. NIR was like almost no flash photography and we could pick it up, we realized he didn't have just one pit, he had multiple pits, multiple pits. and those two pits were so nicely highlighted on the optic disc with the simple uh, non-flash NIR reflectance. The, so this is something which we need to see more often and the wide Im angle imaging system, newer ones have this incorporated with them. They show you the blue green channel and the infrared channel as well. So you can separately use those to image your patients. Right. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so let me just extend the discussion on SAF just mm -hmm. a little bit. Uh, thus far in the phase three trials for the complement inhibitors for geographic atrophy, SAF has been the, the standard. It's been what we've used. But some people feel that perhaps OCT is more applicable to standard practice. Uh, so as we start to treat patients and follow them and assess uh, whether or not they're progressing, should we be using OCT in our practice? Will that give us the information we need? Or do we need to rely on FAF to give us that information? So that's a very good question. So where diagnosis and picking up atrophy is concerned, OCT will be very useful. But if you are going to look at progression, you probably may need to measure it or quantify it. I think quantification is going to be much easier if you have a FAF image and not only OCT. Until we get automatic quantification. <laughs> right, so thank you so much. Thank so you. I think this